you want me to do this? Or comp time is... And they want to not only negate art, but as the, in the way DeBoer put it, also realize it, which is to say, make of daily life a creative, continuously original, delirious, ecstatic experience. This video is the third in a series about self-consciousness. This time, rather than exclusively focusing on Bill Murray, or the history of Dada and Surrealism, although they'll both come up again, I'll start off opposing Solvoy Zizek's version of Hegelian materialism against Alan Watts' Western Buddhism. Along the way, I'll take up an excerpt from Graham Harmon's book Weird Realism and only then return to Bill Murray and avant-garde art, as both appear in the unreleased cult film Nothing Lasts Forever. Without religion, Bad people would be doing bad things and good people good things. You need something like religion to make good people do bad things. Solvoy Zizek, being a Eurocentric Marxist materialist, is a pretty big critic of what he calls fast food enlightenment, or Western Buddhism. He sees such forms of spirituality as inherently conservative. In an essay entitled Revenge of Global Finance, published in In These Times back in 2005, Solvoy Zizek wrote, quote, Eastern wisdom, from Western Buddhism to Taoism, is establishing itself as the hegemonic ideology of global capitalism. But while Western Buddhism presents itself as a remedy against the stress of capitalism's dynamics by allowing us to uncouple and retain some inner peace, it actually functions as the perfect ideological supplement. End quote. What he meant was that Far from giving practitioners of Western Buddhism a critical insight into the prevailing capitalist ideology that could liberate them from the pressures imposed by society, Western Buddhism instead gives us permission to go along with the program. It provides us with the sort of detachment needed if we want to go with the flow, even though what's flowing is financialized capital, hierarchical systems of authority, and a variety of social ills and injustices. According to Zizek, Western Buddhism might make it easier to live under capitalism, but it does not provide a way out. Still, as much as Zizek might want to dismiss Western Buddhism, as often as he makes fun of fast food, new age religious experiences, his explanation of Marx's categories, and thus his own material radicalism, often enough sounds like something out of a book on Zen. For instance, in his essay, The Politics of Alienation and Separation, From Hegel to Marx and Back, Zizek explains Marx's notion of the proletariat this way. <laughs> when and how do I experience myself as universal subject when I am brutally dislocated from my particular identity? How does my desire become universal when it becomes hysterical, when no particular object can satisfy it? This is why, for Marx, the proletariat is a universal class, because it is a class which is a non-class, which cannot identify itself as a class. Announced in Chinese Wuxian means, perhaps more accurately, no self. Alan Watts was an apostate priest from the Episcopal Church who became a popularizer of Eastern philosophy for Western audiences. He wrote books such as Beyond Theology, This Is It, and many other books containing the word Zen in the title. Gaining popularity in the 60s, Watts was the opposite of a square. A critic of Western materialism, he claimed that our scientific understanding was really just a trick or an excuse Westerners used in order to justify their colonial projects. Quote, what we really believe is the fully automatic model, and that is our basic, plausible common sense. You are a fluke. You are a separate event. And you run from the maternity ward to the crematorium. And that's it, baby. That's it. That was a very convenient theory when the European-American world was colonizing natives everywhere. They said, We're the end product of evolution, and we're tough, see? I'm a big, strong guy because I face facts. And life is just a bunch of junk. I'm going to impose my will on it and turn it into something else, you see. And I'm real hard. See, that's, that's a way of flattering yourself. 
end quote. What would be my, how should I call it, spontaneous attitude towards the universe? It's a very dark one. The first one, the first thesis would have been a kind of total vanity. There is nothing, basically. I mean it quite literally. Like, ultimately, ultimately there are just some fragments, some vanishing things. If you look at the universe, it's one big void. The fact that it's not just nothing, things are out there. It means something went terribly wrong. That what we call creation is a kind of a cosmic imbalance, cosmic catastrophe, that things exist by mistake. And I'm even ready to go to the end and to claim that the only way to counteract it is to assume the mistake and go to the end. And we have a name for this. It's called love. Isn't love precisely this kind of a cosmic imbalance? I was always disgusted with this notion of I love the world, universal love. I don't like the world. I don't know how I, I basically, I'm somewhere in between. I hate the world or I'm indifferent towards it. But the whole of reality, it's just it. It's stupid. It is out there. I don't care about it. Love for me is an extremely violent act. Love is not I love you all. Love means I pick out something and I, and it's, you know, it's again this structure of imbalance. Even if this something is just a small detail, a fragile individual person, I say I love you more than anything else. In this quite formal sense, love is evil. It's easy to see Zizek as the quintessential Westerner. Zizek is the ultimate dirty colonizer. But what's missing from such disparaging accounts is any explanation of the humility of Zizek's version of love, the fragility of it. Unlike a Western Buddhist who can let go of himself, part ways with his ego in order to align himself with cosmic order and let it, the universe's logic, guide him, poor Zizek only has his own unsupported act of love to hold on to. And in the end, he can't even feel good about it as he admits that this love is a stupid, fragile, fragmented, and even evil thing. But what we still need to figure out is how it is that Zizek's Hegelian conception of the human subject as a gap, as an absence, is fundamentally different from Alan Watts' understanding of the ego as an illusion. I think the easiest way to understand the difference is to compare two old science fiction movies. One is well known, and the other is utterly obscure. So let's compare, briefly, The Truman Show versus Nothing Lasts Forever. Now, I'm going to align The Truman Show with Alan Watts here and suggest that the unreleased 1984 MGM cult comedy Nothing Lasts Forever would be more aligned with Zizek. In The Truman Show, the plot is simple. A man is secretly a prisoner in a television show. He is, unbeknownst to him, merely a TV character. His whole life has been playing out for an audience. His wife is not really his wife. His best friend is an actor. The town he lives in is a set. Everything is an illusion, and his task is to break free from the illusion, to get beyond the self that he knows in this fictional town, and walk through a secret door and into reality. And nothing lasts forever, on the other hand, the main character wants to be an artist. He wants to create meaningful illusions and to verify his own existence through creative and aesthetic works. He is thwarted not only by the unreality of the world he finds himself in, its absurdity, but also by his own lack of direction. He knows what he wants to do, but he doesn't know how to, or even if he can. And nothing lasts forever, the reality principle gives way altogether. That is, as the story goes along, unreal and fantastical things occur more and more frequently, and the cinematic quality of the picture becomes more and more obvious. Towards the end of the movie, the character boards a bus that is headed for the moon, and once he's there, he discovers the love of his life is living in a lunar dome. She's waiting for him, fated to be there, not because it's God's will, not because of any rational conspiracy, but because the logic of the movie simply demands that she be there. Ow! Sorry. 
In the last video, I tried to tackle this question of how to achieve the detachment necessary for creative critique while not diving headlong into Western Buddhism or Gnostic spirituality. I quoted from Mikhail Bolt Rasmussen's book, After the Great Refusal, and looked at the avant-garde. To close out this video, I want to take a look at Graham Harmon's defense of the art critic Clement Greenberg and see if there might be something worthwhile in this idea of art for art's sake. In his book, Weird Realism, Harmon defends Greenberg this way. Quote, It is by no means the case that the world is a massive, holistic contexture in which everything affects everything else. End quote. That is, the world is not, as Alan Watts claims, a dance of relationships working out a harmony. The world isn't all one thing, with every duality ultimately working out a balance of being. But rather, the world is necessarily fractured. The world is always distorted. The world out there beyond us is partial. In his essay, Avant-Garde and Kitsch, Clement Greenberg noted that in the 20th century, and as Western society fell apart, quote, the avant-garde poet or artist sought to maintain the high level of his art by both narrowing and raising it to be the expression of an absolute in which all relativities and contradictions would be either resolved or beside the point. Art for art's sake and pure poetry appear and subject matter or content become something to be avoided like a plague. In the world of 20th century art, the absolute became art itself. The techniques of art, the divisions between forms of art, the technical possibilities in a given art, art's materiality, these things became the content for the avant-garde. The aim was to stave off the world as it was outside of art, protect what was fine and high from commerce, from politics. This move was done in order to avoid the transformation of art into kitsch. Critique and self-reflection was the only way forward. Only values that a progressive artist could hold on to were entirely negative. Man expresses his need for harmony and a full existence which class society constantly denies him. That is why there is always implied a, a conscious or unconscious, active or passive, optimistic or pessimistic protest against reality in any authentic artistic creation. Art can be the revolution's great ally only insofar as it remains true to itself. Now, here's what I think. Aim to protect high culture from commerce and politics, to hold on to values as against capitalist value, was wrong-headed. You can see it was wrong-headed just by reading Greenberg's essay on Kitsch. In it, he admits that the avant-garde as artists relied upon the ruling classes to be their patrons and their critics. It was, according to Greenberg, only the ruling classes who were sufficiently cultivated to appreciate high art. And this exposes the limits of Greenberg's Marxism. Not because he got in bed with the enemy, not because he eventually abandoned Marx and took up with the anti-communist left, but because he apparently thought that what mattered in modernity, what organized the world, was the culture of the ruling class. If he hadn't thought that, and I dare to say that if Trotsky hadn't thought that, then they might not have worked to discover a pure and self-reflective art, but would instead have worked on developing a self-reflective and maybe even ascetic mode of material production. <laughs>